throughout the centuries, there have been some very interesting presidential elections and debates and campaigns. And one of the things that I was thinking about this week was the various slogans that presidential candidates have used throughout the years. So we're going to start in 1864 during Lincoln's reelection campaign. And his big slogan was, don't change horses midstream. Like, you've, you've started with me, we're going through this journey together, don't change horses midstream. Now, interestingly enough, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, during his fourth presidential campaign, used the same slogan for that particular campaign that Abraham Lincoln did here. William Taft, in 1906, or 1908, rather, said, vote for Taft now, you can vote for Bryan anytime. Talking about William Jennings Bryan, who already had two failed presidential elections, He's like, you can vote for him whenever you want. He's going to just keep running for president. Vote for Taft now. Warren G. Harding, his slogan was, return to normalcy. This is post-World War I. It's like, man, there was chaos. There was, there was all kinds of bad stuff that happened. Let's get back to normal. Elect me president, and I'll get you to back the way things were. In 1924, I love Calvin Coolidge's slogan, keep cool and keep Coolidge. That was probably hip back in 1924. In 1940, FDR's third uh, presidential election, better a third-termer than a third-rater, was what he said about his competition. Harry Truman in 1948, I'm just wild about Harry. Now, they played off some, some modern song of the day. I looked it up. I'd never heard of it before. But he wanted you to think of that. When you went into the voting booth, I'm just wild about Harry. And then you'd use that pencil to color in his, his uh, spot. Uh, Lyndon B. Johnson, his slogan was, all the way with LBJ. Anytime you can rhyme in a presidential slogan, you're probably going to get some votes just based on that. That's why Dr. Seuss books are so popular, by the way. Now, his, <clears throat> the guy he was running against was a guy named Barry Goldwater. And Barry Goldwater's slogan was, Barry Goldwater, in your heart, you know he's right. And it's like, okay, you know, all the way with LBJ... In your heart, you know he's right. But the, the campaign team for Lyndon B. Johnson then changed his campaign slogan and his platform, and it went from all the way with LBJ to Barry Goldwater. In your guts, you know he's nuts. Stuck with the rhyming, though. Isn't that good? Now, we can skip ahead to the most recent presidential elections, and Donald Trump's slogan was, Make America Great Again. Now, here's the interesting thing about his slogan. The people who loved him bought t-shirts and hats and posters and flags. The people who were in the middle knew exactly what his slogan was. The people who hated him knew exactly what his slogan was. That really makes a good slogan. And people were like, well, what does it mean, make America great again? Was America great when we had slavery? Was America great when we were in the Depression? Like, what does it mean? But they were talking about it all the time. You loved him, you hated him, you were somewhere in between. His slogan got talked about all the time. Joe Biden's slogan, because in 2020 it was keep America great. In 2020, does anybody know what Biden's slogan was? It was build back better. It's like, hey, COVID, bad stuff, we're going to build back better. Now, as I start talking about politics, everybody gets a little nervous, don't you? They're like, what are you going to say? What are you going to do? The point of it all <clears throat> is that when you're running for president, you need a catchy slogan, something that identifies your your policies, your platform, or something that's really catchy that people are going to be thinking about when they go to the, the polling place. Because the bottom line is, if you're a Republican, you probably always vote Republican. If you're a Democrat, you probably always vote Democrat. It's the middle ground that they're trying to steal people from the middle independent spot. But here's why I open with all of that. If God had a presidential slogan, what do you think it would be? And it's important for us to think about that, and it's important for us to know that, because we're the ones who take God's message to a world of people who don't know God. So what would you say God's slogan is, or what it would be, if he were, hypothetically, running for president? And I, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that there are two different camps, those who are outside the Christian faith, and those who are inside. And I think those who are outside would say, oh, yeah, what is God all about? If you were to summarize God or the Christian faith in one sentence, it would be something to the effect of, keep the rules or I'm going to get you. 
Repent of your sins, you're going to hell. I don't care about you, stop bothering me with your problems. That's how people outside the Christian faith probably think of God. Could be, because the enemy is really good about tricking and putting false information out there. Could be that we as Christians don't do a good job projecting and preaching the message that God wants people to hear. I think that, I think that if you were going to say or summarize God's slogan, what his campaign platform would look like, it would have something to do with love, grace, gift, something in that, to that degree. Maybe John 3.16 just put the entire verse as his campaign slogan, for God so loved the world that he gave his one only son. But I think that many of us, by the way we live our lives, and when we think about what God thinks about us, in our hearts, we may never say this out loud, but in our hearts, we would say, oh, God's campaign slogan is, I love you, but you better do what I tell you to do. I love you, but you better follow those rules. I love you, but I don't like to look at you. I can't stand you. I love you, but... And for, for a lot of us, when we think about what God thinks about us, it's like, yeah, he loves me, but I'm a really bad person. I mess up a lot. And the way that you come into God's presence because of that is like a dog that's getting yelled at. With your head down and your tail between your legs and like cowering as you come into his presence. Is that what God wants from us? Is that what God thinks about us? Does God love you more when you're really good and you read your Bible and you prayed and you're patient with your kids and you were nice to people at work? And like, is God like, oh yeah, I really love that guy today. But then the next day, you, get up, you guys get up late, and you're yelling at your kids, and they're fighting, and you're like, I'm going to turn this car around, and you get to work, you're like, ah, oh, messed up, first thing. And then you get mad at your coworkers, and you're you know, arguing and fighting, and there's gossip, and then you get home, and you're like, I didn't have a good day. And you feel like God's looking at you like, I love you, but, but here's the thing, is that the way that the Bible describes God's love, there's a Greek word for it, it's agape. Agape love is unconditional. So God says, I love you. There are no buts. There are no clauses. There are no ifs. It's like, God says, I love you. That's it, I love you. God wants you to know, I love you. And God wants us to know that. He wants us to live that. He wants us to be confident in the love that he has for us. And he wants us to go out into the world and preach that good news that God's love for us is not conditional. It's not based on performance. He just loves us. And it's unconditional. It's agape love. And as we continue our series today in the book of Galatians, we're going to walk through chapter 3, verses 15 to 22. And here's the real tension that Paul is unpacking and, and kind of playing out for us. We talked last week about the promise that God gives to Abraham. Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. All the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. 430 years later, through Moses, God gives the law. And really, he gives a lot of laws. 613 laws in the Old Testament, to be exact. Okay, well, you've got the promise given to Abraham, and then God gives the law... How do those two exist together? For the Jewish Christians that were in Galatia, their understanding was God's going to bless all the people of the earth through Abraham, and the vehicle that the blessing comes through is the law. So if you don't do it right, no blessing. And what Paul is going to show is, no, 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 no. The promise and the law do not depend on one another. The promise is independent of the law. The law does show you how you're supposed to live, but not measuring up to the law does not negate the promise. Because when God established his covenant with Abraham, there were no strings attached, there were no conditions. It wasn't, I will make you a great nation if you. It was, I will make you a great nation. Abraham believed God. God said, you're righteous because you just believe what I say. And that are the terms and the conditions of faith in him. So as we walk through it, 
It's like, okay, we've got the law. So for the Jews, it was the Old Testament law. We also have commands that God has given us in the New Testament. How do the commands that God has given us relate to the salvation by grace? How do they exist together, and how are we supposed to think of both of them in light of our life in Christ? <clears throat> this is what Paul's going to unpack for us today. So it's the law, and it's the promise. And this section of Scripture plays out into like three smaller sections. So it's just a good old-fashioned three-point three sermon. Here's the first one, if you want to take notes. The law cannot change the promise. The promise was given, then the law was given. The law cannot change the promise that was already made to Abraham and to his offspring. So here's how Paul begins in verse 15. He says, <clears throat> brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. A human covenant that has been duly established, the Greek word that's used there is literally a will. A will where you, you go to a lawyer and you have things that you sign, you have witnesses that sign, you have somebody who notarizes it, they put their little stamp on it, and this is now law. What you have signed and what you've done, this is what's going to happen. Regardless of what anybody else wants or thinks is best, this is what's going to happen. So hypothetically, let's say you've got a rich uncle that lives in Chicago. And he calls you one day and he says, hey, I'm making my will. Just so you know, when I die, you're going to get a million dollars. That's a great uncle, isn't it? That's where the term great uncle came from. The guy who was going to leave you a million dollars. Like, this is great. He passes away. He was a good Christian man. He's with Jesus. Now the lawyer, who also lives in Chicago, calls you over the phone. Says, hey, I'm reading the will. I notice you're supposed to get a million dollars, but here's a problem. What's the problem? Well, your uncle, I knew him well. He was a great Cubs fan. And I went to your Facebook feed, and you're a Cardinals fan. You're always wearing Cardinals gear, going to Cardinals games. Your uncle wouldn't have wanted you to root for the Cardinals. So because you root for the Cardinals, I'm only going to give you $1,000, and I'm going to donate the rest of it to charity. Does he have the right to do that? No, he doesn't. Now, if there would have been clauses or conditions, your uncle, if he would have said, I'll give you a million dollars if you become a Cubs fan, quite the moral conundrum, isn't it? It's like, what would you do in that situation? A million dollars is a lot of money, but I, I don't look as good in blue as I do red. What would I do in that situation? We'll leave that aside. But if it was on, if it was on the front end, if you root for the Cubs, I'll give you a million dollars, then you've got, a, you've got a decision to make. But you don't get to change it after it was put in the will. Here's the point of it all. Paul says the promise was given to Abraham. The law comes 430 years later, not to change the nature or the rules or what goes into the promise. The promise is the promise. The law serves a completely different purpose, and the law is not the vehicle that the promise is delivered in. They are both independent of themselves. The law does not change the promise so that, okay, I'll, I'll make the Jews a great nation or I'll save you if you can't have that. The law cannot change the promise. And he goes on to really specify who the promise came to and ultimately how it was fulfilled. So in verse 16, he says, The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed, or his offspring. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. So what Paul is saying here is, that when God said, I'm going to make you a great nation, all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you, the promise was to Abraham and Jesus. Because Jesus would be the one to ultimately fulfill the all the nations of the earth being blessed through Abraham. And whenever Scripture talks about our relationship with God through Christ, talks about us being found in Christ and receiving all the benefits and blessings that Christ receives because of his death, burial, and resurrection. It's literally an exchange. His perfect, sinless, righteous life is exchanged for our life. So he dies on the cross for our sins, and when God looks at us, he sees perfection. And the promise given to Abraham also comes to us because of who Jesus is, what Jesus did, and our relationship 
with him. So he unpacks this further. And he says, this is what I mean, guys. The law introduced 430 years later. It does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance, if the blessing depends on the law, on your works, on your effort, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise, so it comes to us through that promise. Not through observing the law, not through ju- jumping through a bunch of hoops, not, excuse me, not through performance or works. It comes by grace through our faith. It's the way it came to Abraham, and it's the way it comes to us as well. So there is no earning your salvation. There is no doing a bunch of stuff to make God love you more. There is just simply responding to the grace that God has given. Now that does start to beg the question. Okay, so God gave us the promise. That's how we're saved. It's by grace through faith. Then why did he give the law in the first place? Why did he even put 613 rules in the Old Testament? Why are there additional rules? Like, <clears throat> love your enemy, pray for those who persecute you. And all those different types. Why, are, why is that stuff in the New If it doesn't matter. If we're saved by the promise, and we're not saved by our efforts, then why is there so much emphasis on removing sin and doing what God wants you to do if it's not what saves you? Well, this is what Paul unpacks. He answers that question for us. This next section is the law is not greater than the promise. The point of the promise was not to bring salvation, or of the law rather, it was not to bring salvation. It is a guide to tell us how to live, but it was never meant to save us from our sins. That was the promise's job, which makes the promise more important and a bigger deal than the law and the rules. He says in verse 19, why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies more than one party, but God is one. Meaning God does not need an arbitrator. He doesn't need people to help negotiate because he's the one who established it all and he's the one who executes it all. There's no negotiated need because God is one and he's the one who does it all. But to say... Why was it given at all? It was given because of sin, because of transgressions. This is why we have rules in our society. Why do we have laws? And why do we keep adding to the laws? Because people are awful. And they just keep doing bad things. So it's like, okay, okay, you can't do that. Now they're doing this. No, actually, you can't do that. Now they're doing this. That's why you have rules in in a kid's classroom. That's why a basketball team has expectations and rules. This is why when you go to work, there's an HR department, and they've got a bunch of things you can and cannot do, can and cannot say. It's because people are mean, they're awful, they're bad. You've got to have rules to set guidelines and set boundaries. So why did God give the rules? Why did God give the law? Because we're really sinful. We do a lot of bad stuff, and we need to, we need to know how it is that we're supposed to live. So the Old Testament, they had rules, rules how Israel was supposed to live as a nation, rules how Israel was supposed to live as a religion, rules that were just moral. Don't murder, don't lie, don't steal. Those are just laws that everybody follows. Then they had specific laws to them as Israelites. Now, we're not Israelites, so we don't live according to the Old Testament laws. But in the New Testament, Jesus says a lot of things. He says a lot of rules. He says, hey, this is how you're supposed to live. And he kind of paints a picture for what life is supposed to look like within our relationship with him. Things that are not natural to us. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Nobody does that on their own. You have to be told this is the way that you're supposed to live. So what you see in the New Testament is, this is how I want you to live. This is what's best. This is what's going to keep you as close to God as possible. The point of the rules isn't to bring salvation. You've already been given that. The point of the rules is, hey, you're naturally a sinful person who tends to be selfish and want to do things for yourself and only glorify yourself and not glorify God. So this is how you live for God. The motivation for living that way is, I've already been saved Now let me live in light of my salvation. Who else would I want to live for? Who else would I want to sacrifice? 
the different parts of my life for, other than the God who loves me unconditionally and has saved me from my sins. That's the primary motivating factor for all of it. And so the law or the rules of the Bible were never given to save us from our sins. They do not determine how much it is that God loves us. What they do show, though, is how much we love God. Obedience to what we see in Scripture doesn't determine how much God loves us. He already loves you unconditionally. It does show evidence and proof of how much we love God by what we're willing to do and sacrifice for him and for his kingdom. And because the law was never meant to impart life or to save us, there is no contradiction between it and the promise. So the final big idea is the law is not opposed to the promise of God. It's not like, well, you can, you can do this and receive salvation, or you can do this and receive salvation. No, 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 it's just the promise gives you salvation. The law acts as a guide as to how you're supposed to live your life. So verse 21 Paul says, is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. So there would be no need for God to give a promise to Abraham. There would be no need for grace. If you could work your way to earn your salvation, then the promise doesn't need to be given. But the bottom line is, that was not the goal or the job of the law in the first place. Now, when you read the Old Testament, and when you, when you look at the people that Jesus interacts with in the New Testament, the people who are really religious and supposed to be really spiritual, and they know a lot of Bible, they're living as if what they do determines their salvation. That they have to do a bunch of things in order for God to love them. They have to do a bunch of things in order to be saved by God. And Paul's like, no. You're using the law in a way it was never intended to be used. The law was never intended to save you from your sins. It's a guide for how to live. But salvation comes by grace through faith. Verse 22, he says, But Scripture has locked everything under the control of sin, So that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. Now when he says that scripture or the law has locked everything under the control of sin, he's just pointing out that when you have rules that are written down, and you are by nature a fallen person, you're going to fall short and make mistakes and not be able to answer the call or reach the bar. So in a way, scripture or the rules stand to condemn us if we try to live by them, because you can never measure up. So the, Christianity is different than every other religion in the world because it is not a rewards-based religion. It is grace-based. Now, some people really like reward-based living. So maybe you grew up in a house where you were the golden child and your sibling was always getting in trouble. You like the reward-based system then because compared to your brother, compared to your sister, you are awesome. The problem is, is that in our relationship with God, it's not how much better or worse we are than other people. It's the standard that is given in Scripture, which is perfection. So if you want to try to live by the law and receive your salvation from the law, you're going to fall short. Just recognize it is 100% completely by grace. The best illustration of this is the thief on the cross. So you remember when Jesus was crucified, there were two thieves, one on his right and one on his left. He's in the middle. Initially, the Gospels say that both of these guys are hurling insults at him. And then at one point, one of them just kind of, as he's observing everything, he's like, "Why why are you saying this about him? to the other thief. We deserve to be here. We're hanging on a cross because we're really bad dudes. But this guy's innocent. And then he says to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom. Please save me from my sins. What bargaining chips does that guy have? Jesus, I promise for the rest of my life, I'll serve you and follow you. 
But yeah, you've got like maybe a couple hours left. What do you mean for the rest of your life you're going to do good? You can't go anywhere. You can't do anything. You're on a cross. You're dying because you're a terrible human being. Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom. You know what that is? That's faith. He believed that Jesus is who he claimed to be. You know what Jesus' response to him is? Truly I tell you, today, you're going to be with me in paradise. Did that guy work a lot to earn something from God? None. Completely, 100%. A gift. It was grace. And the way that Abraham was, it was credited to him as righteousness, thief of the cross, his belief, it was credited to him as righteousness, For us, our faith is credited to us as righteousness. You don't have to wonder what it is that God thinks about you. What you do does not determine how much he loves you. What Jesus did demonstrates how much he loves us. So his slogan, it would not be, I love you but, I love you if, I'll love you when. I love you. And I desperately want a relationship with you. Let me send Jesus to die. The danger that ministers, that churches, that Christians have with this, what happens when people start to take advantage of this grace? What happens when people just come and say, all right, it's just free? I just get saved? All right. Let's get in some water. I'll say a prayer. I'll do whatever you want me to do because I, I, I really want that insurance card. I really want that fire insurance so that when I die, I don't have to go to hell. Well, the Bible speaks to that. And James, the half-brother of Jesus, says things like, faith without works or a demonstration of that faith is dead. Ah, see, you do have to do something to be saved. No. Your effort, your works, what you do for God does not determine if God loves you and it doesn't determine in God's eyes if you have real faith. The works that come because of the Holy Spirit living inside of you are an obvious demonstration to you and the people around you if you have saving faith. God doesn't need to see anything. God can see your heart. God sees the intangibles. God sees all things. He doesn't need evidence. But to make sure that we understand what faith will do in our lives, what the Holy Spirit coming into our lives looks like, it's like, okay, now you should see fruit. Because the Holy Spirit, when he comes and he lives, he will challenge you, he will convict your hearts, he'll equip you, he'll coach you, he'll encourage you. All the things that you need in order to grow in your relationship with God are given to you in the person and work of the Holy Spirit. And it's impossible to have the Holy Spirit in your life, and for there not to be a change that occurs over time. So the works or the efforts, the things that we do through Bible study and prayer and trying to remove sin and trying to treat people kindly and love one, like all that stuff that we do doesn't in any way earn God's love, earn God's favor, earn God's grace, earn our salvation. doesn't do any of it. It just demonstrates that God has come into our life and is beginning to change us from the inside out. So that when you go into the presence of God, the author of Hebrews says you do so with confidence. Not because of you, but because of Jesus. Now you don't do so flippantly and arrogantly. You don't go stomping into God's presence. But you know what God thinks about you. And there there doesn't need to be shame for your mistakes, for your failures. You're on a journey of growing in relationship with him. I was thinking about this this morning. Because as I was leaving, we have a, uh, a garage cat, a cat that catches mice in our garage. We also have a barn cat. Cats are weird, weird creatures. So my cat, Poppy in the garage. As I'm leaving, the garage door is going down. She runs out of the garage. The garage door comes back up. I push the door. It goes back down. She runs back in the garage. I'm like, what are you doing? I push it again. Going down a third time. She comes back out. I roll down the window. I'm like, Poppy, what are you doing? 
she literally stared at me like this. I'm like, what? What is this that is in these devilish creatures? I, I'm sorry for saying, I'm sorry, but really? You know what dogs do when you yell at them? They don't even know half the time. It's like if they hear the tone and the voice, like, I'm sorry, what I do? I love you. Please be my friend. That's why dogs are. It's like, I didn't mean to. What I do? I, I'm sorry. Did I? Oh, I pooped there. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Like, like, dogs are just so, like, I yell at one of my dogs, and they just immediately, and that's, they have this posture. Cats, and that's the reason I don't let my cats inside the house. I think they're going to try to murder me in my sleep. That's the way cats are. Because they're always looking at me and sharpening their claws. Like, I'm going to use these on you. Dogs, though, dogs are just, they're so loyal, they're so loving, but immediately a dog is like, do you hate me? Like, that's the, that's the posture that a dog has. With our relationship with God, you can't be like cats. Okay? That's demonic. Many, many ancient cultures and religions thought cats were demon spirits, by the way. Fun fact of the day. But you also can't be like a dog. Because a dog's happiness and joy is so up and down. You get on a dog and immediately, it thinks you hate it. You just see it. So in our relationship with God, it's got to be level. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to fail. You're going to drop the ball. You're going to let God down. You're not going to live up to perfection. But that shouldn't make you do this in your relationship with God because God doesn't do this in his relationship with you. He loves you. So just live in light of that love. Don't try to take advantage of his grace. Don't take it for granted. Do your best to follow him. But in everything, just be thankful. that He just loves you. And that's it. And as we leave here today, be mindful of that love. And do your best to love others the way that you've already been loved by God. That loved one bracelet, that loved one t-shirt. Make sure it's a part of who you are and treat people in light of the way that you've already been treated by God. Father, help us to understand what this looks like in our lives. I pray that you convict us, that you challenge us. If we lean too much towards law and rules, bring us back to center. If we lean too much towards grace and aren't trying to partner with you to clean up our lives, help us to come back to center. God, help us in all things to live for your glory and for your honor and in thankfulness for what you've done for us in Christ. So, Father, as we leave here, help your grace to be on the front of our minds. Help us in all things to do our best to serve you with everything we have and everything we are. We lift all this up. We pray a blessing on it in Jesus' name. Everybody says, amen. God bless you guys.